Excellent. Well, again, if you are with us for the first time, my name is Chris. I'm the lead pastor here at Hoboken Grace. And right now we are in the midst of this conversation called Starting Point. A couple weeks ago, we looked at how we restart, if you will, or establish a new starting point for our faith. And looking at the early church, we saw that for them, their cornerstone, the starting point of their faith was Jesus, what Jesus had done when he walked out of that tomb. And we said, okay, if we're going to start again, if, if, if we were to go back and rebuild this, what should the starting point be? If we're going to reinforce our faith, what should that starting point be? And, and we look back at, we look at, back at the reality that, that for those who've come before us, that starting point, that cornerstone, if you will, was Jesus and what he did. And we said, okay, we've got to answer that question. If we're going to build a faith that not only survives but thrives when it encounters life, we have to answer that question. We have to work through and make sure that we have a solid starting point for our faith journey. And then as we've continued in that, last week we talked about our own starting point and started about being honest about where we're starting from. And this week as we come together, I want to talk about another starting point because I want to talk about the starting point of faith itself. If we're going to talk about our faith journey, I want to talk about the starting point of faith. Everything in life has a starting point, including faith. And specifically, specifically this idea that faith in some way, shape, or form impacts your relationship to God. That trust, trusting God somehow impacts your relationship with God. Well, that actually has a starting point. And I want to take us back to that starting point because, again, as we continue to look at, okay, who is Jesus? I think it's crucial to understand, okay, where this started. Now, now to do that, I want to take you back to something that really three of the largest religion or faith systems, faith traditions in the world have in common. I don't know if you know this or not, but when you look at Christianity, when you look at Islam, when you look at Judaism, and you look at their starting point, the reality is, is that they actually have a shared starting point. And, and, and each of these three actually believe that God created the world to be a good place, to be a wonderful place, to be a beautiful place, but that sin, as we talked about last week, entered into the picture through Adam and Eve. Now, in, in, in Islam, they believe in Adam and Eve because of the teachings of Muhammad. Inside of Judaism, they believe in Adam and Eve because of the teachings of Moses and Genesis. Inside of Christianity, we believe in Adam and Eve because of the fact that Jesus actually speaks about Adam and Eve and talks about the entrance of sin into this story and how it literally makes a mess of the story. And all three of, all three of these Three of the largest faith traditions in the world, all three of them agree that God created the world to be this, but then sin enters in, makes a complete mess of this. But then they also agree, they also agree that God stepped into that mess with a specific person. As a matter of fact, all three of them go back to this same person. His name is Abraham. And when you look at Judaism and Islam, they actually split at Abraham because Islam holds to the fact that the chosen son of Abraham was Ishmael. And Judaism holds to the fact that the chosen son of Abraham was Isaac. Now, Judaism starts shortly after Abraham. Islam actually starts about 2,600 years after Abraham. 2,000 years after Abraham, Christianity and Judaism split with the appearance of Jesus. And as Jesus steps onto the scene. All of them looking at, okay, what does it mean? As God's looking to clean up this mess, understanding that it is a mess, and I don't think it takes much to convince us that it's a mess. I don't think, I don't think very many of us are here today thinking, you know what, the world just seems like it's exactly the way it should be. This is exactly how I think it should work. If you're here today thinking that, you should watch the news for a week, and then you won't feel that way anymore. And it used to be that we just were exposed to the local mess. Now we're exposed to the global mess. And technology has exposed us to much more of the mess. The reality is that from the very beginning, God has been aware of the global mess. And I think all of us understand, no, no, it's a mess. And, and three, these three, three of the largest faith traditions, they all believe that God stepped into that mess. And specifically, they all agree that he did so with an individual named 
Abraham. And so today what I want to do is I want to talk to you about Abraham because I don't think it's just important in terms of understanding the background of these faith traditions, but I actually think it's important in understanding the starting point of faith, specifically the idea that faith, the idea that faith or trust is linked to your relationship with God. Now, now, now to understand what God does as he steps into the story with Abraham, you have to think about this from the perspective of God. And most of us, we read the story from our own perspective. Most of us, as we engage Scripture, as we engage the story of Scripture, maybe in a setting like this, we think about it in terms of how this impacts me and how this impacts what I'm going to get from God and how this impacts the relationship that I get to have with God. But most of us think about it from our own perspective. One of the things that that I I constantly work to do is to be able to engage the story from God's perspective and to think about, okay, what would this have been like for him? I mean, what would it be like to create something that's supposed to be beautiful, that's supposed to be good, that's supposed to be enjoyed by those that you created, and then to be able to see sin enter into the picture and for this to become a complete mess? What would that be like? And to watch those that you created to love and to love you back, watch them to actually turn against you and to begin to destroy one another. What, what, would, that, what would that be like? And God, as he watches this happen, he has a decision to make. What's he going to do about the mess? I, I was trying to think through an illustration of of this. And I remembered something that, that happened early on when I'd first become a parent. I, I, I only had one child at the time, so I was much happier then. And I'm just, just kidding. That's entirely a joke. It's not true at all if my kids are watching in the future. And, and, but I only had one child at the time. I was, I was a new parent, and new parents are an interesting species. They're, they're, they're a very interesting group of people. And, and when you're a new parent, it's, it's interesting what you enjoy. And as, as my son was growing up, he had just come to the point where he was walking. And as new parents, first-time parents, when your child begins to walk, it's a very big deal. Some of, many of you here don't have kids yet because that's, you're here at the service that doesn't have grace kids. Uh, but, but, but you, you've experienced this because your friends have pulled out videos to show you their child taking a step and you're thinking, when will this end? Uh, this, I have, I, this doesn't interest me at all. But, but as, as a first-time parent, this is a big deal and, and you're obsessed with the first step and then they take a couple different steps and, and then they're actually walking across the room and you're really excited about the fact that they're walking across the room and they're not falling flat on their face and they're not getting hurt. And you're excited about this as a first-time parent for one day, for one day, because that first day you're like, wow, they can walk. And the second day you're like, oh no, they can walk. And they're a lot faster than they used to be. And they can get places and get into places that they didn't used to be able to get into. And if I turn away for even one moment, they are gone and I don't know where they went. And I remember my son had just begun to walk so he could make his way around the house. And Anna and I, I don't don't remember exactly what we were doing, but I know my son had made his way out of the room and Anna and I were being irresponsible parents and not actually following him and keeping up with what it is that he was doing. I think we thought that he had made his way back into his room, but all of a sudden the house became very quiet. Now, again, we're first time parents. We don't know what this means. And and for those of you who haven't experienced this, I want to educate you on this because you need to be aware of this if you become a parent. If you're a parent and your house becomes very quiet, it is the most alarming thing that can happen, okay? The most, the, the, the most shocking alarm is not when the fire alarm goes off. The fire alarm's fine. People will show up to help. It's going to be okay. You know how to deal with that. When your house gets quiet as a parent, it is terrifying. It's terrifying because, listen to this, the most difficult thing for a child to do is to be quiet. It's literally the hardest thing in their life to accomplish. And they are doing something that they so don't want you to know about that they are accomplishing the most difficult thing in their life. 
but we're first time parents, we don't know any better. And so it gets quiet and we look at one another and we're like, this parenting thing's not so hard. Look at, look, I mean, we're crushing it right now. This is so enjoyable, we can relax. All these other parents talk about how they can't relax. Look at us, we can relax. Short time later, my wife walks into the kitchen. Not only has my son learned how to walk, but apparently he's also learned how to open the refrigerator. He's made his way into the refrigerator and he's sitting on the kitchen floor with a package, a carton of blueberries. Not a small carton of blueberries. That would be reasonable for three people to have. But apparently we'd gone to BJ's and bought things that you don't need, which is what you do at BJ's. And so there was a large carton of of blueberries. And he's sitting there on our kitchen floor devouring these blueberries. By the time Anna had made it in, he'd eaten all of them. And we're thinking, this is probably not good. I'm just guessing, but I'm thinking if I ate a whole carton of blueberries, it wouldn't be very good. So the fact that a one-year-old just ate an entire carton of blueberries is probably very bad. But what do you do? We're first-time parents. We don't know. Do you call poison control because of the fact that they've eaten too many blueberries? I don't know. So I guess you just, you just ride it out. So that's what, we, that's what we did. And we went through the rest of the day, and it seemed to be fine. He seemed to be okay. No stomach problems. No complaining. Okay, this is, we made it. We survived. He went to bed. We went to bed. Everything was good. About 2 o'clock in the morning, a scream can be heard across our home. We both jump out of bed, run into the room. I enter the room, and... About 70% of the room was its normal color. About 30% of the room was solid blue. And there was blue coming out of both ends of my child. I'm, I'm not exaggerating here. You could not have hired a professional painter to get better coverage. Of the walls and the bed, everything was blue. And I was like, oh my goodness. I turned to my wife and she was gone. Gone. Disappeared. To this day, I have no idea where she went. Just disappeared. I'm like, what what am I going to do? And I walk over and my son is looking up at me. And he's looking at me like, what just happened? What did I just do? do what? And I looked at him and I said, I have told you so many times not to get in the refrigerator. What is wrong with you? Now you sit here in your own filth and learn your lesson. And I turned around and went back to bed. No, I didn't do that. (laughs) But here's the thing. Listen, listen, listen. Some of you Some of you actually think that that's the way that God treats you. But almost none of you believe that that's actually how I respond. At least I hope you didn't think that's how I respond. I I hope you think a little better of me than... well, most of you said, no, that, that, there's no way that you respond that way. Which means, listen to me, listen to me, listen to me. You actually think that I'm more compassionate than God. Which should make you wonder, listen, which should make you wonder if maybe, just maybe, your view of God isn't Right. As I sat there and I looked at my son, I said to myself, where in the world do you begin? And I I walked into the blue and I picked up my son and I began to peel the clothes off of him. And slowly, I began to clean up the mess. And I'm not going to lie to you. There was a point at which I thought about just finding Anna, wherever it was that she was, 
and saying, okay, guess what? Tomorrow we look for a new apartment. There's really no cleaning this up. There's no resolving this. I don't know that this was ever going to come out. I don't know that we can ever fix this. But we didn't. We slowly began to clean up the mess. And, and the reality is, is this. The reality is, is that as God looked at the mess that sin had made, he had a choice. He could, have, he could have just said, you know what, there's no fixing this. He could have just said, no, there's, there's no hope here. He could have just hung up an out-of-order sign and, and walked away. Start over. Do something different. But because he cared... And don't miss this. This is very important. He had no responsibility to, but because he cared, he decided to engage the mess. But where do you begin? Where do you begin when you're engaging a mess that's that big? You just start somewhere. And as God stepped into our mess, he did the same thing. He said, okay, we're going to start somewhere. And he chose this individual, Abraham. Now, here's the thing. He didn't choose Abraham because Abraham had it all together. He didn't choose Abraham because he was this perfect guy. You don't start cleaning up the mess with something that's not a mess. And so he stepped into the mess and he started with someone who was a mess. And when God steps into Abraham's life, he's actually worshiping idols. As we read through his story, we find out that he has a really big problem with lying. And, and there's multiple times where he convinces his wife to lie about who she is in order to protect himself. I mean, this guy has, this guy's got issues. He doesn't start with something that's not a mess. No, he starts with the mess and he decides, okay, we're going to start here. And so he engages this individual named Abraham. It's about 1876 B.C. Not 1876 like the recent one, but the one that's thousands of years ago, 1876. And God steps into Abraham's life and says, okay, I'm going to engage the mess and I'm going to do something. Not just in your life, no, no, this is a lot bigger than you, Abraham. I'm going to do something in the world. And so he steps into Abraham's life, and he actually makes three promises to this individual Abraham. At the time, he's actually named Abram. God's going to change his name later on in the story. Listen to what it says, Genesis chapter 12. It says, The Lord had said to Abram, Go from your country, your people, and your father's household to the land I will show you. So God steps in, and again, at this point, he's called Abram, and he says, I I'm going to take you to an entirely new place. I'm going to do this amazing thing through you. If you were part of our home initiative conversation last year, you heard us walk through this in depth. But then in addition to that, he makes three promises to Abram. The first one is this, and make no mistake about this, Abram never actually sees these promises be fulfilled, but, but we actually have. Listen to the first of these promises. He says, I will make you into a great nation. Now, an interesting thing about this idea of nation, at this point in history, there was no such thing as a great nation. There were all of these tribes, and there may have been some significantly larger tribes, but this idea that you're going to be a nation, he's, he's literally talking about, to Abraham about something that he doesn't even know about. He's saying, you can't imagine the significance of what I'm going to do through you, and I'm going to do something that is above you, beyond you. I'm going to do something in the world for the world, and it's bigger than you could possibly imagine. Now, here's the thing. Abraham never saw this happen, but there's no dispute about whether or not this actually happened. Now, there's dispute about which nation was the great nation and whether you thought that came through Ishmael or whether you thought that came through Isaac, but no one looks at the nation of Israel today and says, no, that's not a significant, that's not a great nation. And when you look at it historically, you understand, no, God actually kept this promise. 
He steps in and says, okay, I'm going to engage the mess. And Abraham, I'm going to do something to you that's bigger than you could possibly imagine. Not just that. And I will bless you and I will make your name great. Now, again, Abraham never saw this happen, but all of us have seen this happen. Now, don't raise your hands. It's interesting. In every service, I've asked them not to raise their hand. And in every service, someone has. So, listen, don't raise your hands. But how many of you, how many of you have heard the name of Abraham before today? Most of you in this room have. Now, some of you, maybe not. But, but for most of us, we've heard the name of Abraham before. We may not know his whole story. We may not know how he's connected to God and, and Scripture and how, well, how that works or, or, or where he fits in the puzzle. But we've heard his name before. And we exist thousands and thousands and thousands of years after him. He didn't experience this happening, but make no mistake about it, this abs we've absolutely seen this happen. God says, I'm going to make these promises to you. The third promise is this. He says, and all people on earth will be blessed through you. This is actually going to be about something that's bigger than the nation. It's going to be about something that's bigger than your family. It's going to be about something that's even more important than the fame of your name. He says, no, I'm going to impact. I'm going to bless everyone every person through you. And from a very practical standpoint, if you've ever been impacted positively by any of those faith traditions, you've experienced this. And there are thousands upon thousands upon thousands of thousands, hundreds of millions of people who have been, who have practically experienced this through those faith traditions that have come out of Abraham, but in addition to that, in addition to that, as he's speaking to Abraham here, he's talking about the cornerstone that we're going to continue to examine, this idea of who is Jesus, and how does this, how does this have anything to do with how we engage God? The reality is that Jesus comes through Abraham, and ultimately this promise is going to be realized in what it is that Jesus is going to do and who Jesus is. But even if you just look at it from a practical standpoint, you see that no, this has actually happened. God says, okay, I'm going to engage this mess and I'm going to do this through you, Abraham. But listen to me, listen to me, listen to me. The, the most significant thing as you see God step into the mess is not actually the promises that he makes to Abraham. The most significant thing is actually how Abraham responds to the promise. So God steps in and he makes this promise. And if you're, if you're Abram, at the time you think, well, okay, if this is going to happen, then get ready. I'm going to have kids. Because when this promise is made, he has no kids. He has, how do you make a nation if, there's no, if you don't even have one child. So he has to be expecting, okay, this is going to come pretty soon. We got to get started. We've got to... But as the years start to go by, Abram starts to really struggle with the promise. As a matter of fact, a little while later in the story, you see him praying and talking to God about this. And he's asking God, okay, when is this going to happen and if something doesn't happen soon, I'm getting older here. Like, I'm getting significantly older here. If something doesn't happen soon, this isn't going to happen. And, and, and everything that I have is going to go to just an individual who's a part of my household that's not even an heir of mine. And he's talking about this individual named Eliezer. And God engages him in this conversation. And this is one of the most, one of the most significant moments in the story of Abraham. Listen to what it says a little bit later, Genesis chapter 15. It says, Then the word of the Lord came to him. This man, he's talking about the individual in Abraham's household, will not be your heir, but a son who is your own flesh and blood will be your heir. He took him outside and said, Look up at the sky and count the stars, if indeed you can count them. Now, here's the thing. This kind of breaks down if you live in Hoboken, because some of you, some of you are like, the stars in the heaven... Because here in Hoboken, if you live in this area, you go outside, you look up at the stars, you're like, two. Well, there's, I think I saw two on a really, really, really clear night. 
And God says, this is how many offspring you're going to be. Okay, it sounds like a good American family. doesn't sound that big. But if you've ever traveled outside of this area, you know that there are more stars than that. Now imagine if you were to walk outside in the Middle East before the invention of the light bulb. He says, he says, Abraham, I want for you to look up and I want for you to see all of the stars in the sky, which would have been phenomenally overwhelming. And he says, so shall your offspring be. He says, I know you're struggling with the promise, but I want to reiterate that promise to you. And then, and then something is said that, again, I would argue is the most significant thing in the story of Abraham. Listen to what it says in the next verse. Abram believed the Lord and he credited it to him as righteousness. In this moment, Abram decides to trust God. He believed him and it says as a result of the fact that he has faith, God credits to him righteousness. In other words, God credits to him a right standing with him. Last week we talked about how sin breaks relationship. God in this moment says, okay, now you and I are reconciled. You and I are restored. The relationship is restored. You and I are good. And he does so based on what? Faith. Because Abram has faith. Now, if you've been a part of Hoboken Grace for very long, you've heard me say this over and over again. Faith is not when you feel like something is true. If you look back at the previous verse, you know Abram's struggling with how he feels about this. It's not feeling like something is true. It's acting like something is true even when you don't feel like it. And God says, as Abram moves forward in the story, he's consistently making decisions based on what God says is true. He has faith. And God says, now, that's it, right there. What you, that, that right there, that is what restores us. And in this moment, in this moment, God not only steps into the mess, but from the very beginning, he begins to share with us what he's going to do to fix the mess. And he says, listen, I want you to understand something. When it comes to you and me, when it comes to our relationship, when it comes to you being loved and accepted, when it comes to us being restored from what sin had broken, that is restored based on what? Based on faith. Now, this has been a point of contention for every, for every single faith tradition from this point forward because, because all of us think that's too easy. And so even as you move forward from here, by the time Jesus comes on the scene, for those who are part of Judaism, they'd bought into the idea that, no, 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 you're not made right with God because of faith. You're made right with God because of the fact that you're an ancestor, because of the fact that you're a descendant of Abraham. And so you're born into being right. And so we, as the Jewish people, we're made right with God because of our heritage, because of our ancestors. As you move forward down the road, as it pertains to Islam, they say, well, it's important that you believe in God, but it also, you have to do certain things and you earn your way into paradise. And if you do enough of these things, then you're going to be able to be made right with him. Even from the moment that Jesus gives his life inside of the faith tradition of Christianity, there is an immediate argument about whether or not you're actually made right by faith or whether or not you're made right by keeping the rules. As a matter of fact, many of the letters that are written to the churches talk about this over and over and over again. Why? Because there's something inside of us that says this is too simple. This is too easy. It's got to be harder than that. And everything in life tells us that it's got to be harder than that. Because every other relationship in your life, you are loved and accepted, not based on faith. You're loved and accepted based on performance. 
You're loved and accepted based on how you perform in terms of how you look. You're loved and accepted based upon how you perform in the way that you love the other person. You're loved and accepted based upon what you have accomplished. And even if you grew up in a really loving home, you still experience this. And your parents would look at you and say, we love you all the same. And your sibling would look at you and say, you know they don't. Or maybe you would look at your sibling and say, that would be nice, wouldn't it? But you were better at what your dad enjoyed more. Or you were better at what your mom valued more. And you learned. We've all learned. No. You're loved and accepted based on what you do. Based on how you perform. But God says, from the very beginning, not with me. Not with me. No. You're made right with me based on faith. God steps into the mess. Listen to me. Listen, listen. Very closely. Come here, come here, come here. God steps into the mess and he says, I don't need you to clean up the mess. I just need you to trust me. I don't need you to clean up the mess. I just need you to trust me. As a matter of fact, he says, the reality is, you can't clean up the mess. But if you will trust me, I can. And if you will trust me, I will. When I walked into that room and, and as I stepped into the blue, I didn't, I didn't need my son to clean up the mess. And the reality is that he had no way of doing so. And if he had tried, it would have only made it worse. You know what I needed him to do? To trust me. To trust me that I could. Rather than fighting me, to trust me. Rather than fleeing from me. Rather than running from me. To trust me. Rather than trying to clean it up himself. To trust me. From the very beginning of God stepping into the mess, he says, no, 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 no. This isn't about you cleaning it up. No, 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 no. The reality is that you can't even do that. No, I just need you to trust me. And if you will trust me, I can and I will. Let, let, me, let me ask you something. How do you believe that you're made right with God? Do you believe you're made right with God by how you treat people? Maybe it's how many times you show up to church. There are a lot of different ideas out there. But what if what if all God needs for you to do 
is to trust him. What if we're not the ones who clean up the mess? What if he is? And he just needs us to trust him. I invite you today to at least open your mind to the possibility that maybe, just maybe, rather than God making it harder for you to be made right with him, he actually made it easier. Will you pray with me? Father, as we look at what you What you did as you stepped into that mess, how from the very beginning you left no question about how it is that we're made right, how it is that the mess is cleaned up, how it is that the relationship is restored. And Father, I pray for those of us who so struggle with this because everything in life says, no, 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 love and acceptance is based on performance. And how could a God that's so high make it so simple? I pray that today we would at least open our minds to that reality, that we would engage you in this conversation to ask, could it possibly be true that you're the one who cleans up the mess and you just need us to trust you in Jesus' name, amen.